All right, it's now 7 o'clock. It's time for us to start our leadership Bible study. My name is Apostle Preston Mitchell. Um, we will be starting, continuing on the series that we're currently teaching on, Marks of Spiritual Leadership. Um, we're going to be coming out of John chapter 17. So far we've covered Marks 1 through 9. We're only going to review what we covered last week. I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to go back over the same lesson every time. Um, we should be finished with this lesson. It's going to be about a four or five session uh, teaching, I do believe. So tonight we're just going to review uh, Marks um, 6 through 9, and then we're going to pick up on 9 and continue on for about, I'd say about an hour or so. And then we'll, um, if you have the number where you can call in and ask any questions, I'll give you that number. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to call in and ask or make any comments, I'll go ahead and give you that number so you can do that. Um, thank you for joining us tonight, and we're going to open with prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to come in and to fellowship and receive your revelation knowledge from your spirit. We thank you, Father God, that as we come here and have these lessons and have these sessions and hear from the Holy Spirit that we become not only better leaders, but we become better believers, more effective in our spirit of influence and community. I, Father, I pray for every leader that I'm mentoring and discipling, Father, that they would get this revelation knowledge, God, that they would pick it up, God, that they would use it, God, that they'd be more effective. And in the kingdom of God, and thank you for this opportunity again to come and preach and teach the gospel to your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And so tonight, um, what we're going to do is, we're just going to rehearse over what we, what we, where we started off last, we stopped off last week. Uh, the mark number six of a good spiritual leader is a servant leader stewardship. Those God entrusted to him. Look at, let's look at uh, John chapter 17, uh, the, the latter part of chapter uh John 17, 6, and it says, I have manifested thy name which the men which thou hast given me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and, and they have kept thy word. So what Jesus is basically saying is here, those that, he get, that God entrusted with him, he kept all them. He didn't lose any of them. And then not only did he keep them, he didn't lose any of them, but also everything that God entrusted to him, he, he, um, he did not lose. So as a, as a mature or a mark of a good spiritual leader, whatever God gives you to put your hand to, you, he entrusts that to you, and then you, what you have to do is you make sure you keep that. Whatever God entrusts to you, the people that God entrusts to you, the ministry that God entrusts to you, you have to make sure that you keep that, and not only do you keep that, but that you give it what God gave you. You push it in that direction. You mentor it, you disciple it, you preach it, you teach it, you work with it, you walk with it, you pray it into that direction. To make sure that you don't lose any of them and that they don't lose their relationship with God. Mark 7, the number, Mark 7 of a, a good man, a mature spiritual leader, is um, a steward leader's resources. All God has given to him, everything that God gave to Jesus, he gives to his disciples. Look at John 17 and 7. John 17 and 7. It says, Now they have known all that thou of things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So what Jesus did is, Jesus did not teach or preach. Doctrine that he did not receive from the Father. Everything that Jesus got, he relayed that information. Listen, in clarity and purity, he did not give, he did not teach them or give them anything that the Father did not give him. Everything that he heard from the Father, he specifically gave to the disciples, and that's what we're supposed to do. That system is to, is to continue. What we hear from the Spirit of God, that's what we're supposed to teach. We're not supposed to teach our own beliefs, our own philosophies, man-made traditions, but we're supposed to teach the things that the Father taught. And listen, everything that the Father told Jesus is what's in the Bible. Okay? Next. Okay, Mark 17, Mark, Mark number 7, continue. We're still looking at Mark, uh, John chapter 17, verse 7. Okay, so here's the evidence when we only relay the information per the Bible that Jesus Christ relayed to the disciples as disciples. So the first thing is that, the evidence. We have a spirit-filled life according to Mark, uh, Romans 8 and 14. Okay? We're led by the Spirit. We're filled with the Spirit. We move by the Spirit. We're led by the Spirit. We're sons and daughters of the Spirit. And we're not led by emotions and our feelings. Because when you're led by your emotions and your feelings, you can miss God. You can miss what God is saying. But when we're led by the Spirit, every time when we're led by the Spirit, we do what the Spirit teaches, t tells us to do. And as the Spirit teaches us and leads us and gives us that unction, we're not going to fail. Okay? Jesus was thoroughly immersed in God's Word. What does that mean? 
Everything that Jesus taught was from the God. What you have to understand is that everything that we teach and preach as, we, as, we, as spiritual leaders has to be the Word of God. Study the Word of God. We know those scriptures. We looked at them last week. The next thing is we have to ma manifest the presence of Christ. How do we do that? Love. Remember, we talked about that. Love. Love is to, to, to love unconditionally is to manifest the presence of Christ in your life. Okay? The next thing, wisdom of God. That scripture talks about if any man let have back wisdom, let him do what? Ask God who gives liberally and unbraided not. So when you don't have wisdom or you need wisdom on how to be a mature spiritual leader, who do you ask? You can ask, you can get information, and you can get references, and you can ask, talk to people about their life experiences. But if you really want true wisdom, spiritual wisdom, heavenly wisdom, we always go to the Father. And the Bible says that if you go to Him and ask Him for wisdom, He's not going to fail you. Amen? The next thing is the love of God. John 13, 34 through 5, Jesus says, A new commandment I write. He tells him again, a new commandment I write. What's the new commandment? That you love one another as I have loved you. He says again, love one another. And he says that by this all men will know what? That you are my what? You are my disciples. Okay? The next thing is the power of God. Acts 1 and 8. He says when the power comes, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you should have power. Okay? And we, when we read those scriptures we talked about earlier, we talked about, he said, in Samaria, Judea, and in all the world. So there has to be a ministry within your local area, your national area, and then a universal area. Amen? It's mark number seven. Okay? Number seven, to continue. Do those you lead know the resources of God are indeed present in and through your life? If not, why not? Okay? The things that we just talked about, the power of God, the love of God, the wisdom of God, are these resources that you have as a leader available to those that you disciple and mentor? Do they see these resources in your life? If they're not in your life, why in your life? Where are we as leaders missing the mark when we don't have the profound and those resources that are provided us through the Spirit of God, through the Word of God? Why don't we have those resources being manifested in our life? Because listen, if those resources are not manifested in my life, they're not going to be manifested in your life. And if, if you lead people, and you, if you only lead one person, those resources, if these things are not manifest in your life, you can better believe they're not going to be manifested into the people that you're supposed to disciple. But watch this. These things were manifested in Jesus' disciples. Now, did Jesus' disciples have issues and problems? Absolutely. We have issues and problems. However, that being said, these things were still manifested in their life. Amen? Okay? Mark number 8. A spirit, a servant leader teacher's heart that the disciples may learn. Look at 17 and 8. John 17 and 8. We're just reviewing what we talked about last week briefly. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come out from thee, and they have believed that thou hast sent me. Okay, so we, hear, we see here in Mark number 8, continue, there is a threefold combination of this scripture. Okay, and the first thing of this scripture is receiving. When you teach people, you have to teach people the Word of God. And what the first thing they have to do is you're teaching the Word of God. The first thing they have to do is what? They have to receive the Word of God. Once they receive it, they have to know that it came from God. And if they know it comes from God, then they're believing that God sent you and that everything that you're teaching them is going to lead them to eternal life. And what do we say eternal life it is? John, what? John 17 and 4, I think it is, it says, Eternal life is not going to heaven. Eternal life is not a big car. Eternal life is not a big ministry. It says to know the only one true God, what? And his son, Jesus Christ. This is eternal life, okay? Well, the essence of what God purposed for um, these three, four, three, four combinations was the essence of what God had purposed for the disciples. That they would receive the word, they would know the word, they would believe in Jesus, which is the word, and then they would go out and make an impact in the world. Okay, eight continue. Okay, and on this threefold combination, Jesus would do what? He would build his church according to Matthew 16 and 8. Give them the keys to his kingdom according to Matthew 16, 19. Commission them to take his gospel to all people, the great, the great commission, the latter part of Matthew 19 and 20. And then he would fill his he would fill them with his spirit to enable them to accomplish it all, and that's Acts 1 and 8. Okay? So there's receiving, there's knowing, and there's believing. And once you get this combination or you teach this combination, the next thing you're going to see is you're going to see the manifestation of what you've been teaching and preaching according to God's word. You're going to be able to build a church and people will be added to the church daily as God should get, God should allow. Not what you should allow or who you think should be added to the church daily, but as God allows. God adds to the church daily. The next thing, you have the keys to the kingdom. You will understand and you have to teach 
and preach disciples to understand a kingdom mentality. Even though they were born in certain countries, they come from certain ethnic groups, that, that plays a role, but the most important thing is they, they need to understand they are kingdom citizens now, and what the king of the kingdom wants them to do, and how he wants them to operate, and how he wants them to talk. The next thing is commissioning them to take his gospel to all people. The purpose of the plan of redemption was not for us to get saved and form these little clip so-called churches we have. And again, the church is not the church is not a bunch of people coming together. The church, when you do that, you're just the saints are assembling themselves according to the word of God. The church is in you. Every believer is a church. The church is in you as a believer. So when you get together, you're not a member of a church. You are the church. The church is in you. So everywhere you go, you take the church with you. That's why the Bible says, forsake not the assembly of the what? Of the saints, not the church. Because the church is in you. Okay, so we get kind of in, I'm a member of this church. No, you're a member of the body of Christ, which is the church. He is the head of the what? The church. He's not the head of a building. He's the head of you. You are the church. You are the, you are, and he even talks about these earthen vessels, these temples. We don't even know the ecstasy of what we have in Okay, so I'm a, I don't, I, that that kind of that kind of leads people in the wrong direction because they get so caught up with the church that they go to or the church that they attend or that's where their church is. No, the church is within you, so you don't have to worry about that building. You just assemble there. That's a place that you worship, and that's a place where you assemble, and that's a place where you hear the word of God taught and preached. But you are the church. Okay, the next thing is fill them with His Spirit. To fill them with his spirit so they can go out and accomplish everything that he wanted them to do. And not just go out and accomplish the things. What he wanted them to do is he, he has empowered us via the Holy Spirit to get the job done. So we have to understand that concept as well. Okay, Mark number 8. Every leader must have a passion to teach God's people until they are thoroughly convinced by God who Jesus is. Okay, and everything rests on this. Everything rests on you being able to preach and teach the people so profoundly and so prolifically, listen, but simplistic, very simple, of who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ's purpose was. That's what God wants us to know. And once you understand this, you receive Jesus Christ as your what? Lord and Savior. Now you're in the kingdom. Now you are what? A disciple of his, okay? Everything rests on this, okay? To fail here is to fail in God's plan to redeem the world. If we cannot adequately and properly teach and rightly divide the word of God. People are not going to know who Jesus is. And if they don't know who Jesus is, if they don't have an intimate relationship with the Father and with the Son, because in order to get to the Father, you have to know who? The Son. You have to go through the Son. There is no other way to know the Father but through the Son. No other way. I don't care what people tell you. The right hand of fellowship in the local church means nothing if you've never confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can be baptized 15, 20, 30 times for whatever reason you want to do. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You cannot know the Father. You cannot experience eternal life. You have to know Him, and not just know Him, but you want to know Him in the fullness of who He is and every attribute and characteristic of Him so that you can be a model yourself after Him. Because that's who we should model ourselves after, Jesus Christ. And we remember, uh, this teaching and this preaching, this is the thing that causes redemption to take place in the world. But until we get the revelation that we should, we should, we've got to go back to what Jesus is teaching here in John 17 as spiritual leaders, we must go back to this principle of understanding that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith, and without him we can do nothing, but in him we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us, but also that this is the plan of how salvation works. This is the plan of redemption. Okay, so now we're going to start uh, Mark number 9, a servant leader's prayer focus. Not that the world, but those entrusted to him. Look at John 17, 9. 17 and 9. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Jesus says he's not praying for the world. He's not praying, listen, he's not praying for the lost. He's praying for those that God has gave him. Why? He wants them to model themselves after him and do what he did so that he can, they can become good disciples and model themselves and do everything that God wanted them to do so they can impact and change the world. What good is it doing Jesus or us to be praying for the world and they don't even know God? They don't even have the attributes of God, the attributes of Christ. They don't even know the proper way to love, the proper way to forgive. They have none of, none of this. Is, this, is, this, is, this is foreign to them. It should, it's not, it should be foreign to us, and this is what he's talking about. Okay? The Bible mentions Jesus leaving the multitudes 
taking the disciples with him so he could teach them. Remember he was talking in the parables and then they're like, well, what did that mean? And he explained to them what the parables mean. He said, for them, they won't get it, but you should get it and understand what it is. He wasn't talking to the multitudes. He took, talked to them in a parable. What did he do when he got the, his disciples one on one? He did what? He taught them and explained it to them so they could understand what he was talking about. So I, the, the, your, your, you know, and this is the area that I want to talk about a little further is as I was studying this out and I was uh, uh, meditating on this. Listen, our job, when we have, if we have one disciple that we're working with, our job is to pray this prayer for their life that Jesus prayed for his disciples. See, a lot of times what we're praying for our disciples is that God will bless them with a job. God will bless them with a house. God will bless them with all these things. But we're not praying that God will bless them spiritually. We want God to bless them materially. But they need to be blessed what? Spiritually. They need to get this revelation knowledge first. It said, seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and all of its righteousness, the right way of doing things and being in right standing with God, and all these other, what? Things shall be added unto you. Okay? Okay, number nine, continue. Listen, Mark. It says, when Jesus knew Satan had requested to, to sift them as we, he assured them, I have prayed for you. Luke 23, 31 through 32. Paul assured the Romans that Christ makes intercession for us. I'm going to go back to that one in a second. Paul knew as Jesus did that the redemption of the world depends on God's people being disciples. Listen, if you get saved, what if you get if a person is saved, their job is to become they, they should be a disciple and have the ability to at least win one soul, to at least make an impact in their spirit sphere of influence. Now watch this. Paul says here in Romans that Christ is an intercession. But who is Christ interceding for? Is Christ interceding for the world, or is he interceding for his disciples? He's interceding for his disciples. Even though he came in the flesh, now that he's ascended back to the Father, listen, he's still acting in the role as a spirit, a servant leader. Why? Because he's doing what? He's still interceding for what? His disciples. He's still praying the same prayer he prayed when he was in the earth realm for his what? His disciples. He's not praying for the world. He's praying for his disciples. Now, here's what I'm, the revelation I'm getting from this John chapter 17. As a person who mentors and disciples of the leaders, my job is to pray the way Jesus prayed in John 17 for those that I mentor and disciple. Now, the people that are being the people that are being mentored and disciple, if they're not mentoring the disciples and they're just disciples themselves, who should they be praying for? They should be doing these other prayers, prayers for leaders, praying for leaders. Praying for the body of Christ. This is their job. They should do that. But as ministry, as spiritual leaders, we have to pray the people that we mentor and disciple, out the, the disciples and people that God has trusted us, we have to pray this prayer that Jesus is praying. We have to make sure that we model ourselves after Jesus in John chapter 17. Because that's what's going to make a difference. Okay? And look, here's our focus. You must focus on God's people as your major passion and prayer. Okay? Faithful intercession with those entrusted to you is crucial. It is a mark of a spiritual leader whose heart has been shaped by God. Okay, listen. He doesn't say here, he doesn't say here that our prayer focus should be on the world. He doesn't say here that our prayer focus should be on the economy. He says that our prayer focus should be what? For those entrusted to you is crucial. So every person that is assigned to a, 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 a servant leader, that's who they should be praying for. That is their prayer. That should be their passion. Because listen, remember we talked about something else we talked about. Remember? We talked about a legacy. Remember that? That a servant leader wants to leave a what? A legacy. Did Jesus Christ leave a legacy? Yes. Did Paul leave a legacy? Yes. We don't know how many... Elijah left a legacy. Did Mo, uh, Moses leave a legacy? Left. They taught someone to carry on what they had received. Okay? And Jesus Christ being the greatest servant leader there is, we see that his... His, his legacy is continuing on and on and on and on. However, as individual servant leaders, we have to create a legacy for ourselves. We have to create a legacy of disciples and leaders that, we, that, we, that model themselves after us as we model ourselves after Christ. Paul, Paul said, follow me as I follow who? Christ. What's another word to say? Follow me as I've modeled myself after Christ. But we, we spend a lot of time Trying to, trying to find uh, church building, church planning, church growth. How about we just use the Bible? How about we just use the Bible <laughs> for church growth? How about we just 
stay faithful and pray for the disciples that we have so that those disciples can win other disciples. They can grow and mature, and people can see the, the Spirit of God or God manifested in them the same way God was manifested in Christ. But if our focus is church growth and church planting, you know, and, and church planting as well, but if God didn't tell you that, that's not what you should focus on. You should focus on what God told you to do. Don't worry about the other stuff. Worry about your disciples as a servant leader. Worry about those that God has entrusted to you. And if God hasn't entrusted any to you, you need to find out why. If you say that's what God has called you to do. But if God has not entrusted anyone to you to teach or to train or to mentor or disciple, why? Maybe, just maybe, I'm just saying, maybe because you're not lining up with John chapter 17. Okay, that was, that was our review for tonight. We're going to pick up <coughs> where we left off last week, and it's on Mark number 10, a servant leader's reputation. <coughs> if you look in your Bible, John 17, 10. Okay, the lives of his disciples. Okay, let's look at this. Let's see what John 17 and 10 says. John 17 and 10. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. So it says, and all mine are yours, and all thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Okay? So what is Paul, what is Jesus saying here? A servant leader's reputation has to be the lives of his disciples. Okay? He said the lives of the disciples, examples of what Jesus taught, and his, his very life in them was what glorified Jesus. It is not enough that he gave them head knowledge. Their lives must manifest the full life of Christ, their Lord, to a watching world. As the Father was glorified in the Son, so Christ will be glorified in his disciples. What does this mean? Their lives, it's just not enough for you to, to read the Bible. It's just not enough for you to know leadership protocol. It's just not for you to know how to pray. It's just, that's not enough. What has to be is that your life, that you can teach people, but knowing that, they can get a lot of head knowledge. They can understand the doctrines of Christ. They can understand apologetics, homiletics, um, exegesis. They can understand all these things, how to speak Greek, how to dissect it in the Roman, how to read the concordance, how to do all these wonderful things. But it's just head knowledge, okay? And just head knowledge is not going to impact the world. What, they, what has to happen their lives must manifest the full life of Christ, their Lord, to a watching world as the Father was glorified in the Son, so Christ will be glorified in the disciples. What does that mean? Because as the Father was glorified in the Son, what does that mean? That means that you could see God in Jesus. And now, Jesus, going past head knowledge, he's putting the hands-on experience, right? You're seeing him being manifested in disciples. That's what we have to see in our lives. The people that we mentor and disciple, our disciples, or God's disciples that he's to trust us, we have, to, we have to move to such a degree that they see Christ in us and that they want their lives to be changed and manifest, manifested or changed to a degree or to, to, to a level where they, have, they live like we live. They see Christ and God like we see. They don't let the things of the world bother them. They don't, let, they don't get caught up in the world, worldly system. They understand the, they have to have a kingdom mentality. And, being, and having a kingdom mentality, then they can make a change in the world. There, there, there can be a manifestation of Christ in them, the hope of glory. The same way God was glorified in Christ and Christ was glorified in God. The same way disciples nowadays, now we have to be glorified in Christ and we have to allow Christ to be glorified in us so others can see Christ in us. Okay? This is crucial. The leader is only as effective as the lives of those he or she is leading. Okay? What does that mean? That means I'm only going to be effective based upon what you do. If I, if I can't see, if I can't see the teaching and the preaching and my life being manifested through you, I'm talking about the life of Christ in me being manifested to you, I'm ineffective. Because am I making truly making an impact? The answer is going to be no. I'm not making an impact in any way, form, or fashion. It could, I could have 20 disciples. And if I'm, if I'm only making an impact in one, at least I'm getting somewhere, but now I need to re find out why I'm not making an impact in the other 19. Is it me or is it them? Or is it a combination of both? Okay? Okay, the next thing. 
The people we relieve are a reflection, manifestation of our life. Okay, you know, one thing I always say to people is, once I get to know a pastor or a leader, and I get to know them, and I see they have certain characters and traits, I can usually tell who their disciples are, good or bad. You know, you have some disciples who, you know, they come from a pastor or apostle or bishop where they're very loving and they're very kind, and they will extend themselves to help anyone in any way. They are a reflection of their leader. But then you have some leaders who are very arrogant, self-willed, conceited, and it's all about me. Guess what? What do their disciples look like? Their disciples look just like them. Did you have someone, you know, they're old school, I can say old school, for, for lack of a better word, they're very um, Old Testament tradition, women shouldn't wear dresses, doilies on their head, women shouldn't wear pants, doilies on their head, these type of things. Where do they get that from? Where do you, where do you think they get that from? They get it from their, from their leader, right? They get it, so what happened? Whatever, how the leader lives, and how the leader, the leader's life, how the leader's life is, it's manif there's a manifestation in the people. Now, in some cases, it's not the leader that the leader is doing good, it's the people aren't submitting to that authority and that teaching. That's another thing you will see. Okay? Okay, next thing. A spiritual leader produces spiritual followers. Fruit produces after his what? Own kind. Okay? So if you have a, a, a person who is a leader, but they're not spiritual, what kind of disciples are they producing? Carnal, worldly disciples. Whatever the, whatever the leader's focus is, whatever their mandate is, suppose their mandate is for the kingdom, that's what they're going to train their disciples. If their if they're, if they're teaching and preaching is one-dimensional, um, prosperity, all of their disciples are going to be what? One-dimensional. Everything about them is going to smell, talk about, they're going to see the whole uh, redemption experience and the whole life of the believer about one thing, prosperity. Then you have the other ones, the real deep in holiness. And I love being holy. Trust me, I do. But that's just, being, well, that's just one aspect of being a believer. What about being a disciple? What about love? What about trying to win souls? What about showing kindness and patience and temperance? What about all those attributes of a leader? You can be holy but be, be a person that doesn't forgive. You can have be really holy and, and, and operate in bitterness, envy, and strife. So you can't be just one dimensional. You have to experience the fullness of God. You have to experience the fullness of what Christ did. Okay? And that comes from 2 Timothy 2 and 2. Let's look at that. 2 Timothy 2 and 2. Let's look at second. Let's see what 2 Timothy 2 and 2 says. Second Timothy 2 and 2. Okay, it says, And the things that thou hast what? Heard of me among many witnesses. Let's stop there. Paul is telling Timothy, the things that you've heard of me, you're just not hearing them from me. He said, but also many witnesses are confirming what I've told you or what you've heard. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. So what Paul is saying here is that he says, the things that you've heard of me, the things that I've taught you, all right, and you've seen this among many witnesses. It's not, it's just that I'm saying I've taught this. Other people have verified it. He said, you take the same thing that I've taught you, right, and what do you do with it? You, you, you commit the same, and the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others, okay? So what is he saying? He is producing what? Spiritual what? Followers. He's, and listen what he's saying. He's saying not, not, and Paul, and Paul is very specific. Paul is saying, don't go out teaching everybody else's stuff. You teach what I taught you. Okay? Okay, Mark number 11. Okay, a servant leader's investment. John 17 and 11. John 17, 11. Okay, 17, 11. It says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are, thee, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name 
those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Okay? Now, what it says here, rest in his disciples, faithfulness. The, the implementing of what God accomplished in Christ to redeem the world would now rest with his, with his disciples. A spiritual leader must give close attention to the, those entrusted to him or her. After the leader is gone, his or her work, God's work, will rest with those he or, he, he or she has led. Okay? So, so what is Jesus saying? Remember we talked about a reputation. Remember we talked about uh, not only a reputation, but what? A legacy. Okay? And accomplishing the mission. We talked about that earlier, right? So here we see is what is the, 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 spirit, the servant leader has to invest time in his disciples. Jesus invests the time. He has to invest, he or she has to invest time in such a degree that they are they are fully um, persuaded that neither life nor death, whatever the case may be, shall separate those disciples that they have raised up from the love of God and that they will continue in the same form, fashion, teaching, preaching, rocking, dividing the word, not getting caught up in the traditions of men, which make the word of God in that effect, but they will stay right on that course, that path that that servant leader has taught them. As long as it's what God wants to be taught. Okay? Number 11, continue. To ensure the continuation of God's redemptive work, Jesus did two things. Let's see what they were. Okay? What was the first thing? Jesus thoroughly in, invested thoroughly in the disciples the Father gave him. The second thing was, pray that God would do in them what he had done in Jesus. Okay, so what's the first thing? How do you invest in your disciples? How did Jesus invest in the disciples? Jesus gave himself totally as their what? He was just not their leader, but he was also their what? Servant. He said the greatest in the kingdom is not, the greatest in the kingdom is a servant, correct? So Jesus, the way he invested in his disciples, one, he not was their leader, their teacher, their master, their rabbi, but also he was their servant. Number one, he invested his life. Watch, the ultimate sacrifice, he invested his life for his disciples. He invested his life for the disciples, right? And then not only that, but he, God, he prayed that God would do in them what God had done in Jesus. And what did God do in Jesus? Jesus, God redeemed the world through Jesus. What is Jesus praying? Jesus ultimately wants his disciples to do what to the world? He wants them to redeem the world, those that they come in contact with, back to the Father. Okay. But the focus in today's, in, the, in, in saints today, is not, uh, we don't want to invest any time in the disciples and those we lead. You know why? Because they're, you know, we see the people as a burden. We don't see the people as a treasure, as we learned in Exodus. We don't see the people as an investment of, of, of a legacy for ourselves. We don't see the people as our duty and our responsibility. We see the people, remember we said earlier, that a good servant leader does not take advantage of the people and use the people for their own pleasure or to get rich or to get, make a name for themselves to say, oh, yeah, doctor, I got 500, you only got 300. That's not, what, that's not what it's about. It's all about understanding that God has entrusted you with one person, two for And let me sidebar for a minute. Let me digress for a second. There might be pastors that watch this at some point or might even watch tonight. You're concerned that, you know, your ministry is not real big. You only got 10 people, okay? Well, I will say this, and I will say this because I know it's true. Every pastor is not called to lead multitudes of people. It's not true. Okay, if that's the case, how many did Jesus ultimately lead? Twelve. He ultimately led twelve. So we cannot measure the success of what we're doing by numbers. The Bible says that God adds to the church, David, as he should see fit, right? So you have to understand if you only have 20 people, that's where your focus needs to be. Don't worry about the 21st person. Don't worry about person number 25. Don't worry about person number 100. Worry about one through 20. Train them up, teach them, invest in them, pray for them, get them into the will of the Father, get, get the word of God in them, get the love of God in them, so that the world will see that they are disciples, all men will know that they're disciples, and they can impact the world. Now, as they begin to go out and win more souls, maybe some come in and, and, and align themselves with that local ministry, and maybe they don't. Does that really matter? 
No. What matters is that another name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, not on the church rolls. Here we go again with that. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The church roll is written in heaven. It's not written at your local church by the church administrator or secretary. The church is not a social club. It's not a fraternity. It's not a sorority. It's a living entity, a living spiritual entity full of different people with different problems and situations, but still they are part of the church, the universal body of Christ. So remember, this is how it works. We have to, we have to invest in the disciples that the Father has given us. See, I don't, here's, here's, my, here's my philosophy on leave. If you come to me or you come to a Bible study or whatever, or you join up with our, with our fellowship, that means that you did it on your own and I have a responsibility to be available to you, to pray for you, to invest time in you. Listen, at no charge. Okay, let's go there. Did Jesus charge his disciples? No, at no charge. This business about you deciding what your honorarium is and how much, how much you think that your preaching is worth, you're an idiot. As you just said, rock up. That's ridiculous. That's not even in the Bible, anywhere. That's manipulation. Yep, I said it. It's manipulation. I don't have a right to charge for the gospel. You know why? Because freely I receive, freely I should do what? I should give. And if you don't have enough money to get it done, maybe God don't want you to do it. You cannot manipulate the disciples. You cannot use ministry as a tool to get rich. And I know this teaching about, oh, so-and-so was rich, so-and-so was rich. Okay, they were. But here's the thing. Is that what God purposed for Our job is to teach the what? The Bible. To win disciples. To minister discipleship. If God wants us to prosper, God will prosper us. But let's, first of all, let's get back to the basics of being servant leaders. Not lords over God's heritage, according to the Bible. That's not what he called us to be. Okay, Mark 11 continue. Look what a wise spiritual leader will do. Let me back up from that one. Okay, a wise spiritual leader will do what? Invest carefully and purposely in those who trust in him or her. We talked about it earlier. And then pray consistently for the Father to work in them. Okay? All, all, see, any, anytime God gives you something, he's entrusting you with it. And if it's something that you have to invest time in, you got to invest time. Again, your disciples cannot, you cannot look at them as a burden, but as a blessing. Because God, anytime God gives you people, he entrusts with people, that is a great responsibility. And check this out. God gave you those specific people because there is something in you that can relate to those people. Whatever God has placed in you in the spiritual realm is for those people. The Bible says, a stranger's voice he will not hearken to. That, is, that applies to, to leaders and men, to servant leaders and disciples. The, the, the people that God sends you, there's something, there's a clarion call in your voice for those people. They're, they're not going to hear the voice of a stranger. They're only going to hearken to your voice as the Spirit leads them. And you need to be purposeful in investing them and constant, constant in prayer for them. Okay, number 12. John 17 and 11. John 17 and 11. It says, And now I am no more in the world, Right? A servant leader of success, and now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I have come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Okay? John 17, 11. To ensure that each finishes well. Now watch this. Okay? The thing is that what we want to ensure is that every disciple that God places in, under, in our, in our that, we, that, that he's given us, and trust us with that they finish well. Now Jesus is returning to the Father and asking him to what? Keep them through his name, keep them through your name, those whom thou has given to me. Okay? All the Father is, as Jesus revealed him to the disciples, would secure them permanently in Christ. So the fullness of God and his purposes would be expressed and accomplished in and through them. Okay? So what Jesus said here, watch this. Okay, so now Jesus is leaving. Jesus is now what are we dealing with? He's, we're dealing with legacy, correct? We're dealing with Jesus' legacy. And so Jesus knows that the only way that the legacy is going to continue 
is that if he prays, he prays. He prays before he leaves. Father, keep through your name, not through my name, not through religion, not through denomination, not through the bishop, not through the apostle, not through the mother of the church, not through the estuc, pre, pro, potentate, prelate, prelate, first, first district, domicile, whatever all that stuff is. He didn't say that. I like that right there. He said, keep through your name those whom thou have, you have given me, right? And so the father now has to honor that request. So God keeps them, right? And then all the Father is, is Jesus revealed him to the disciples. Everything about God, Jesus revealed him back to the disciples. The disciples did not know God. They did not understand God. They did not understand God's way of thinking, God's way of doing things. Jesus revealed the character and attributes of God to the disciples, okay? And by him doing that, would secure them permanently in Christ. Right? So the fullness of God and his purposes will be expressed and accomplished in and through them. So, uh, listen, the only thing Jesus did, he taught them and, expre he, and he made himself an open book and a living expression of the attributes and characteristics of God. And not just the attributes and characteristics of God, but also how God operates. How, how God would handle a woman taken in adultery. How God would handle a young rich ruler that came to him. How God, how God, how God would handle these situations. And he did it with kindness, he did it with patience, and he did it most of all with love. Because God is love. Okay, let's look at John 6.39. John 6.39. It says, and this is the Father's will which has sent me. Uh-oh. <laughs> Watch. He says, now this is what? Whose will is it? The Father's will, correct? John 6, 39. He said, and this is the Father's will who have what? Sent me. So Jesus is saying, number one, what I'm about to tell you is the Father's will, and I didn't come on my own. He sent me. Okay? It's written in red. He says, now, that all, that all, with that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Good God Almighty. What is he saying? He's saying, first of all, this is God's will. That every disciple that God has given to you and entrusted you with, that you should lose how many? None. And that they should be raised up when? At the last day in the resurrection of the saints. That's God's will. God's will is that one, it's God's will based upon the fact that he sent us that, that everything that we should lose what? That all of which thou has given me, I should lose none. See, again, it's not what you go and take. It's not what you use through deception and, 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 and filthy lucre sake and traditions of men and wise tales and fables that you get, but everything that God has given you as a, as a servant leader, you should lose nothing. And the way you lose nothing is that we just saw that you would pray that the Father would keep them in whose name? His name. Now that we should lose nothing and that on the last day, every disciple that God has given you should be raised on the last day. Because you have to make an investment in the disciples. You have to pray constantly for your disciples. Not, not for the world. Remember, even we, we, in, in the scripture, he talks about that we pray not to keep the, any, them, the enemy from them, but keep them from who? The enemy. The prayer is not devil, say, keep, say to stay away. God, keep the devil away. No, the prayer is not keep the devil away. Keep me from the devil. Keep me from evil. Because my flesh will draw me to evil things. See, we don't read the Bible. Jesus gives specific instructions on how to deal with these issues. So let's look at this says right here. So it says, a spiritual leader must commit to God. Hey, look, not some, not one person, not the people that we don't like, not the people that have teed us off and made us mad. Every person God has entrusted him or her, bring each person to the fullest relationship to the Father, his Son, and his Spirit. 
Each must purposely respond to all of God's activity to assure that his eternal purposes for them will be secured. Okay, what does that mean? That means when it says we must respond to all of God's activity is that we have to get instructions from God of what we're supposed to be doing with his disciples. See, I, 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 it, it amazes me that these series that people come up to teach the disciples that have nothing to do with God. Because that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the end thing to do now. It has nothing to do with God. So when it comes time to train and train and raise up disciples, who should we be asking? What activity should we be following? We should be following God's activity. We should be, we should be following God's mandate. It's God's will that he sent us that all that he's given to us, we should lose nothing, none of them, not one. Not one person that God has entrusted us with should we lose. That's not the will of the Father. It's the will of the Father that they be kept in his name and that on the last day they be raised with us. It's a sad day. It's going to be a sad story when we get raised and some of our disciples that we mentioned as disciples and lived in grace because we didn't invest in them and we didn't pray for them properly. What's our excuse going to be? It's in the Bible. He gives us clear instructions on what to do. We just, we choose, what I found out is we choose not, as, as servant leaders, we choose not to do what the Bible says in certain areas of leadership and mentorship and discipleship because it's not the proper thing to do. And then people will say, you know, that's old-fashioned. And, and there's no, you know, a council of bishops and apostles hasn't approved that yet. Or the Lord hasn't told me to do that yet. Let me tell you something. You don't got to pray about the Lord telling you to do John chapter 17. Jesus did it. So if Jesus did it, that means you're supposed to do what? Do it. Paul said, follow me as I what? Follow Christ. If I'm going to follow Christ, whatever Christ did in the Bible, I'm going to do it. And if God is backing me up, it's going to come to fruition, and it's going to, be, it's going to manifest with power and demonstration. And there are going to be results, kingdom results, of lives being changed and souls being redeemed into the kingdom. Any questions? Okay? Many today are beginning well, running well, but not finishing the race. A spiritual leader will ensure that each fit. Listen, you know that scripture that talks about the, the shepherd will leave the 99 to go find the one? Why is that? Because the shepherd knows that all the sheep might begin well, and all the sheep might run well. But somewhere down the line, some sheep are going to go astray, and what does the shepherd have to do? It's the shepherd's responsibility or the spiritual leader's responsibility to ensure that he gets all the sheep to where they're supposed to be. That they make it along the journey. And so we have to take the same mentality. If God has given you a person, why are they astray? Boy, that's killing me right now. Boy, that's cutting deep right there. Boy, that's cutting deep. Where, where are they at? I have a responsibility now to find, okay, what's the problem? Why aren't you at Bible study? Why have I heard from you? What's going on? I have to now, based upon this mandate, to just, just cut me to the core. Just cut me to the core. I've now got to go out and do some sheep finding. Did I do something to offend you? What's the problem? Why aren't you where you're supposed to be? Why aren't you doing the things that I, you know that to be doing right? Because I want you to finish. You've run well. You've been in the race for a while. But what is, what's caused you to trip, trip and stumble? That's my responsibility. That's a weight that God has placed on my shoulders. And I have to answer for that if I don't follow through once I get revelation knowledge and the Spirit speaks to me profoundly and I see it in the Word of God. See, and then I can't go back and say, well, Lord, I didn't hear you. <laughs> I got, got it out of two witnesses. I got it from the Spirit that just cut me and I'm seeing it in the Word. See, but I'm, just, I'm no different than anybody else. I'm very transparent. I get, I get, I get frustrated with disciples too. I get, I get frustrated with the pastors that I have to deal with and the ministers and the elders. I get frustrated just like anyone else would get frustrated. But you know the one thing I've learned? That they're not mine, they're God's. So I just got to do what God tells me. And as long as I'm giving them a good product and I'm making myself available to them and I'm loving them and I'm being patient with them. And, you know, I get frustrated sometimes. I get upset, but then I go to God. And I ask God to forgive me. And then I go back to them and say, if I've done anything to offend you, I apologize, forgive you, but what's the problem? And if they don't want to be reconciled, there's nothing I can do. But you know what? I'm going to do my part. And I'm going to be fervent about doing my part. We want to make sure they all finish well. Okay? John, uh, Mark 13. A servant leader's joy, his disciples. Let's look at John. John, we read, we've already read John 11. 
Let's look at John uh, 17, 13. John 17, 13, the latter part. Here, and now I come to thee, and th these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Okay? Jesus is saying, listen, the same things that I speak, Jesus' joy was his relationship with his Father, and that his disciples would be in this, in this same relationship so that they would be as one. My joy is to see you be successful as a, minister, as a servant leader. That's my greatest joy. My joy is to see a person come, come into a, a Bible study or a training session or talk with them and see them grow and mature and become and perfected in the things of God, in their walk with God, their relationship with God. And then as, though, as their lives are changed, according to what we're reading in John chapter 17, as their lives are changed, guess what? They begin, other people begin to see God glorified in them, Christ glorified in them, the Spirit operating their lives, and now they can make an impact in the world and win some other disciples. And redeem some souls back to God. That's the, that's, that's the purpose. 13. A true spiritual leader's joy is in, is in the oneness with his or her people. One with each other because they are one with their Lord. The corporate life, the corporate life of God's people is a reflection of their co corporation, cooperation and personal relationship with their one Lord. Okay? Watch this. Now. Here's, here's the thing that, that, that confounds me, is that how can I say that I'm a Christian or believer, but I don't love other believers that don't believe the same way I believe? It's just a, it's just a matter of doctrine, but why, why, why don't certain people like Baptists, and Baptists don't like tongue talkers, and tongue talkers don't like Dress wearers and doily wearers. Why? We're supposed to be as one. If we're, how can we truly be one with the Father when we're not one amongst ourselves? How can servant leaders or ministry leaders or mature spiritual leaders say that these people are weirder than we are? They're, they're not weird. They just have a misunderstanding of the Bible. Well, they've never been taught the truth. That doesn't make them weird, but we have to be one. A house divides itself against itself cannot what? It will not stand. And so, in, 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 the, in, the, in the universal church, we have to make a concerted effort to become one, as Jesus and the Father are one. He wants us to be one with Him. But how can I be one with the Father when I'm not one with, his other, with my other brothers and sisters in the body of Christ? Something is, something is seriously wrong. So then I have to reevaluate my thinking. I have to reevaluate how I love, how I demonstrate the kingdom of God which is in, which is in me, how I demonstrate Christ is in me. At any point, did you see Christ discriminate against anyone? He never even discriminated against those that wanted to kill him, and eventually did, crucify him. He showed the same love, temperance, and patience to everyone that he encountered. Everyone. So we have to strive, we have to strive as believers to be one, not just with the Father and the Son, and let His Spirit be a part of us, but also what? Other believers that don't necessarily believe everything that we believe. I'm not talking about heretics. I'm not talking about apostates. I'm talking about where there are, where there are minor doctrinal issues that we don't agree on. We all agree that Jesus is the Savior of the world, but one person agrees that, you know, tongues are not for now. That's fine. You can, that's up to you. If you don't want to have the power of God, that's your business. But that doesn't mean I'm going to separate myself from you. If you still believe, you know, that the, you know, that the Sabbath is just on Sunday, that's fine. That's your day of the Sabbath. I, the Bible says I can, whatever day I choose is the Sabbath, as long as I'm the Lord. I don't have a problem with your Sabbath being Saturday. I don't have a problem with your Sabbath being Wednesday. That's between you and the Lord. You don't want to pay your tithe? I don't got a problem with you. That's, you. that's between you and God. You're still my brother or sister. See, it's doctrinal issues that cause us not to be one with Christ and the, the Father and the Son and amongst each other. But can we agree on one thing? That Jesus is Lord? That he's the Redeemer and Savior of the world? Can we agree that if we confess in our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and we're now saved, whomsoever shall call for the name of the Lord should be saved? Can we agree on that? Now, if we can agree on that, we're good. All the other doctrinal issues, we just have to work out. But we still have to be one in that area. 
And that's the thing that makes us one. That we confess in our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised from the dead. Now you're saved. We are one. Okay? A spiritual leader will always work and pray to this end. Jesus had said this oneness and love would be the distinguishing mark to the world that they were his disciples. We saw that again in John. See? See, it's all about what? The L word, the God they love. We in the body of Christ have to love each other. And we have to demonstrate that love. How can, how can I go to a person that's not saved, that does not know the Father, and does not know the Son, the Father through the Son, and tell them I love them, right? When I see a person in the body of Christ and I refuse to talk to them. I won't even greet them. I won't even speak. But I love them. Father, the, the Bible says, how can you love God who you never see and hate your brother who you see every day? Now something's wrong with that picture. And so this is one of the reasons you have so many cliques and schisms in the body of Christ is because we, we agree that we, support, we, we say with our mouth that we confess Jesus Christ. We say with our mouth that we believe in our heart that God raised him dead and we're saved. But we don't act like it. We don't, act like, we don't have this oneness amongst us. And if we don't have this oneness amongst us, how can we have this oneness with the world? Maybe we are of the world and not of the kingdom. So remember, this is what he's saying that we should do. Our prayer should always be that the people have the love of God, that the God is manifested in them, Christ is manifested in them, His Spirit is manifested in them, that they stay in the race, they don't give up, that they finish it to the end. But most of all, is that they have this one. This, remember what eternal life is again. Eternal life, according to John chapter 6, 17, is to know the one, only, the one and only true God and His Son, whom He sent who? Jesus Christ. That is eternal life. Mark 14, a servant strategy. Let's look at John 17, 14. We're going to look at the whole story. A is what we're keying on. We're going to look at the whole thing. John 14, 17, 14. I have given them thy word, and the world have hated them, because they have not, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Okay? So the first part is, I have given them thy word, and the world have hated them. Okay? What are we going to learn here? To give his disciples what? God's word. Let's stop right there. Okay. I'm not reading. I'm not against reading other books. I'm not against studying other books. I'm against when you take that book and elevate it above the word of God. I'm against that. Okay. The Bible is the all and out final word. It overrides everything. Right? And so there might be books that we read and study and use for teaching mechanisms that line up with the word of God. But ultimately, the Word of God is what we should be teaching and preaching. And if it does not line up with the Word of God, that is not what we should be teaching and preaching. Okay? If Jesus had a strategy for the disciples' lives, it was to receive the words of the Father for them and share them faithfully. God's Word for the disciples was their very life. Okay? That makes sense, doesn't it? If you work for, if you work for any type of company or organization, most companies and organizations, if you work for them, they have what they call SOPs, Right? Standard operating procedures, right? And so as a worker in that company, what you're supposed to do is they give you a handbook. Or, or you have, you're part of that, that corporation. And each corporation has its own strategy and philosophy. Is that correct? Okay? And so you're supposed to be a part, you're supposed to understand the, 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 the strategy and the philosophies of those, that company. And when you're doing business, you're supposed to execute those strategies and philosophies. Correct? Okay, now why do we, we can do that on our job, but we can't do that with the, in, in, in our relationship with the Lord? Why can't we look at the Bible as a strategy and the philosophy of how we live our lives? Because if you look at the Bible, or you look at God's Word, God's Word covers every aspect of your life. Ask me how I know. Okay? Remember we said, if you don't understand something, if you need wisdom, ask who? God. If you have an all with a brother or sister, the Bible tells you how to what? Resolve the all the conflict, right? If you have need healing in your body, According to the book of James, if you're sick, the Bible gives instructions on that too, doesn't it? If you, have, if you don't love your wife, the Bible tells you what? Your prayers will be hindered according to Peter. Am I correct? Does the Bible tell you how to raise up your children and raise your children in the admonition of the Lord? 
Does the Bible tell you that? Does the Bible tell you to go to your job, mind your business, eat your own bird, and work with your hands? Does the Bible tell you that? <laughs> Does the Bible tell you how to receive the windows of heaven being open for you? The Bible tells you that, doesn't it? It says, if you pay your tithe and offering, God said, prove me when? Now. And see what I will not prove from the windows of heaven and pour you out of blessings that you will not have room to receive. That's in Malachi. Am I correct? So the Bible, the Bible is a strategy and philosophy for, for your life. And what Jesus was basically saying is that God gave him the strategy and the philosophy and the protocols for the disciples' lives. And what Jesus did, every philosophy and every strategy that God gave him, he gave to the disciples. And were the disciples perfect? No. But did they come along and make an impact in the world? And the answer is what? Yes. They made a great impact. Deuteronomy 32, 46, and John 6 and 63. Okay, 14 continue. A spiritual leader knows that it is not his or her words or thoughts God's people need. Okay, that's a good one. You know, even part, the Apostle Paul, he wrote some things. He would say, listen, this is, I'm, I'm saying, I'll let you know, this is not of the Holy Spirit. This is just me talking. So you take it for what you want. But ultimately, everything that he taught us came from where? It came from the God, God. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus did not share with us his own words or his own thoughts. Everything that he shared with us is things that came from God. Okay? God is the one who has a word and purpose for each of his people. Listen. <laughs> now, this is going to get real deep and spiritual, right? And someone's going to say to me, ah, oh, that doesn't make sense, but it does. Even as I'm standing here speaking to you and teaching, right? If it is truly from God, if it is truly from God, it is a word and purpose for your life. It is a word that should change your life, and it should give another aspect of your life purpose in the kingdom. Right? If it's from God. Now, if it's not from God, nothing that I say is going gonna, is gonna to resonate in your spirit, and there will be no purpose of it that's going to help you change your life or mature as a believer. Or change the way you see yourself or your, job, or, or your responsibilities as a servant leader. And then you can just dismiss it all. But I know it's from God. Okay? A spiritual leader like Jesus receives from the Father and shares what he hears with, with the Father's people when? Daily. Okay? There should all, you should always have a word of some, even if it's a word of encouragement or something for your disciples every day. You might not see them every day, but by chance if you talk to one, there should always be something in your mouth. You should always have some tidbit some nugget, some piece of meat for their life, a purpose for their life, right? You know why? And, and let me tell you why most people don't have it. Ask me. I know why. Because, listen, the only way you're going to get a daily word is to spend God, time with God when? Daily. As a servant leader, you have to spend some time with God daily. Jesus got up early in the morning and spent time with who? God. To get instructions and direction for the people and to be strengthened by the words that the Father spoke to him. Encouraging him, letting him know that the Father was with him, that the Father had not forsaken him, that the Father would never leave him, and that everything that he was hearing, the Father was going to confirm by miracles, signs, and wonders, and by the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. So you have to have a daily relationship. Listen, you have to, you have to seek the Lord daily. You have to get a word daily. Every day you should, get a, you should have something on your lips for somebody. Okay? Daily happening or done every day. The word daily means something happening every day or something done every day. Okay? What does that mean? Study the word what? Daily. Pray daily. Interact with God daily. 15. A servant leader's burden. John 17, 14b. Okay? The world's hatred. Okay? Jesus knew the full-blown hatred of the world toward him, okay? He also knew if the disciples followed him, the world would hate them also. No one can serve two masters, okay? So what, how, does, how, does this, how is this rebel, uh, prevalent or relevant to, to us today as believers? First of all, the average believer is in, a, is, is, is in a state of delusion, right? And they're blinded to the fact that the world hates you. Hear how you can tell that the world hates you. Start talking about Jesus. 
When people say to you, well, why are you happy all the time? It's because of Jesus. Well, why, why, why does these things bother you? It's because of Jesus. Why would I curse you out, talk about you, mistreat you? You still treat me with love and kindness. Jesus. And when you ever notice that when you do that, they get angrier. They become even more hostile. Because again, you're not of that same mindset. So Jesus understood this. And so that's why Jesus said, the very presence of God and his word create decision. That's good right there, okay? So here's, here, here's how that works, right? Do you remember when we were saved and we, we were churchgoers and we thought that was the right thing to do to go to church? And it was, but it didn't do us any good because we really didn't, we, really, we went, but we really didn't receive anything, right? But did you know that every time the word of God is presented or the word of God is present, you have to make a decision to either accept the word of God or, or rebel against the word of God as a believer, and if you're not a believer, every time you hear the word of God, you have to make a decision either to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or continue to be a child of the devil. So wherever the word of God is, wherever when the very presence of God is word, create what? Every time you hear the word of God, saved or unsaved, it's a decision-making process. And the decision-making process is, and what is what I'm hearing for me, one, and if it is, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to hearken to it, or am I going to continue to do things the way I do things? Which one is it going to be? Okay. A heart not open to God will reject him and his word with ever-increasing violence. Okay? What does that mean? If a person, you ever notice that if you've ever witnessed to a person who's not saved, the more of God's word you begin, you know, if you're just having a conversation with them, or just talking with them, everything's fine. But then the more of God's word you begin to, to speak, and you begin to speak to them, and sow the word to them, the more antagonistic they get with you, and the more violent the conversation becomes, to the point where they, be, at first they're really nice, and everything like that, then they start cursing, and they get violent with you, because again, this is what the word of God does. The word, listen, the, the word of God, the, the, the plan of redemption was a violent experience. The Bible says since the time of John, the kingdom suffered violence, but the violence taken what? By force. We are, we are under this illusion that this is a kumbaya experience. And that because we don't, we don't have the ability, most people don't have the ability to understand spiritual warfare, they think that it's a kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya, I'm a believer, everybody loves me, everybody's going to accept Jesus Christ, everybody wants to hear me talk about That's not true. And most people, because they're not their disciples, but the only place they're being, only thing they're doing is just hanging around the church or their local assembly. They're not really going out witnessing into the into the highways and hedges and byways. They're just staying amongst believers, which is which blows my mind. That's a whole other issue, right? All believers just stay amongst themselves. That's cultish. Yeah, I said it. That's cultish. The, the mandate was going to the world and reach mankind. That's what the mandate was. But people always say, well, I'm, that's not my job. Everyone is a disciple that calls the name of Jesus and say, Every person. Okay? A true spiritual leader knows that his or her own life will come into conflict with sin and the flesh and the devil. What does that mean? If you are a servant leader and you understand kingdom, you understand that you, listen, not you, not me, all of us have to understand that we will come in conflict with sin and the flesh and the devil. Every believer, from the highest bishop, potentate, whatever, prelate, whatever y'all call them, to every apostle, to every prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, deacon, mother, Sunday school teacher, janitor in the church, bus driver, every person that calls upon the name of the Lord and has been saved will have this conflict. And I know a lot of people that are in leadership don't tell you that. They make you think that their lives are a nice sliced bread with peanut butter and organic jelly on it. And that they don't wrestle with sin. And that they don't have problems with their flesh. And that the devil does not come and tempt them. At least one thing you know about them is they're a liar. If nothing else. Because if the enemy came and tempted Jesus, as he was led by the Spirit to be tempted in the wilderness, if the, if the enemy came and tempted Moses to smite that rock that caused him not to go into the kingdom, if Elijah, after he slew the prophets of Baal, the next thing you know, he wishes he was dead. If Jonah refused to go and preach to Nineveh and found himself in the belly of the big fish, what you think is going to happen to us? 
Don't, 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 don't believe the hype. Know that every believer wrestles with sin, their flesh, and the devil. And, and, and listen, if, if that weren't true, he would not have given us the armor of God. He would not have given us praying in tongues. He would not have given us the spirit to lead us and to guide us in our truth and understanding of what's going on. He would not have given the ability of the discerning of spirits, according to 1 Corinthians, I think it is, chapter 12. He would not have given us all that if it is not real. Why did Paul say there, the things that he wanted to do, he didn't do, and the things that he wanted, didn't want to do, those are the things he do because there was a war in his members? Why did Paul say that? And he's the, he's the author of the New Testament of the New Testament church's instructions, majority of the New Church, Testament church's epistles and instructions. And here he is having this war in his members. He's having a problem with sin, he's having a problem with flesh, and he's having a problem with the devil. But people today don't have that problem in leadership. Spirit leaders don't have no, you know, oh no, Lord child, no, oh, I don't got no sin in my life. You've got a lying spirit, that's what you got, nothing else. He or she gains victory in his own life, then seeks to prepare God's people for the op opposition and pain they will experience when they become true and passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Now, this is important here because it says when they become what? True and passionate. Follow See, you can be a lukewarm believer. But then he spews you out of his mouth. He says, I'd rather you be hot or what? Cold. Don't be lukewarm. So you have to understand as well as a lot of times the reason you don't have no opposition from the enemy is because, number one, you're not a threat to his kingdom. A lukewarm believer is, no, is a, not a threat to anyone. Because we're, a lukewarm believer or leader or whatever you want to call yourself is not going to actively engage the kingdom of darkness. It's not going to actively witness. It's not going to actively say, the reason I am the way I am is because Christ, the hope of glory in me. Christ being manifested in my life and me being led by the Spirit, me being baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance, and that I have a super, I have a life that's been, my spirit has been recreated, born again by the power and the love of God. Okay? The great burden of a spiritual leader will be, excuse me, the shepherd's care for his or her flock, even to lay it down of their own life for them. Now, watch this. Every lead, spiritual leader has a, should have a flock. If it's one person, you still got a flock, okay? But then it's part of laying down their own life. Does that necessarily mean dying for them? In some cases it does. But what does that mean? That means you've got to sacrifice your life for the sheep. Remember we talked about earlier how the sheep should not be a burden? They're our responsibility. They're God's treasure. They're our a legacy for us. We've got to be. We've got to be. We've got to be ever working diligently, right, to make sure that we take care of the sheep that God has entrusted in our in our care. Okay. Let's look at John ten and eleven. John ten and eleven. Fifteen is where. Uh, Mark number 15 is about getting on 8.15. Mark, Mark number 15 is where we're going to stop tonight, and we'll pick up in our next session where we left off at 16 and move forward. Okay, but let's look at these three, these three scriptures here and see what this, what this means. John 10 and 11. Let's see what, what's being said here so that we'll get an understanding. Okay? John 10 and 11. Okay, John 10 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. Okay? So a good shepherd gives their life for the sheep. Ultimately, in Jesus' case, Jesus gave his life for the sheep. But what this means for us, it could mean us laying down our life and being crucified for the body of Christ. But it also could be mean that we sacrifice our desires and our wants for the sheep to make sure that they get what they need. Let's look at Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So what is this saying to the husband? 
This here is saying to the husband, as a good shepherd of his wife, he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the what? Church, and gave himself for it. Okay? He sacrificed himself for the church. 1 John 3.16 Hereby receive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the... Uh-oh. <laughs> he says that we ought to lay down our lives for who? The brethren. Not the world. That we should lay down our lives for who? Our brethren or our brothers and our sisters who are in the body of Christ. Okay? A burdened heart is a characteristic of a true spiritual leader. He or she carries the hurt of God's people. Okay? When you, when, when you see a person, one of your disciples or people you've been... When you see them not coming along, when you see them failing in life, when you see anything negative take, you should have a burden and it should hurt you the same way it hurts them because you want them to rehab, understand and feel the fullness of God and the fullness of Christ and the love of God. But we're selfish. We don't want to lay down our life. You know what I mean? It's like saying, I want instead, you know, instead of on, on a Thursday night, you know, there's something else. I like, I like the bike and training, okay? On Thursday night, it's usually my bike, one of my bike nights. So what I, what I begin to say is, okay, Lord, guess what? You understand. Tonight's the night I can be biking. But tonight, you know, it's more important for me to bike than me to teach Bible study. It's more important for me to stay home and watch scamming. It's more important for me to make excuses because the weather's a little bad outside. But in that same weather, I would drive to my job that you provided me, you provided for me. But, you know, that's not important right now. I don't want to lay down my life. I want to pick and choose how I serve you and when I serve you. But remember, God... I'm the same person that every time I need you, I come begging and running and crying. And you've been faithful to help me. And you've been faithful to provide. But I'm not faithful in the relationship. Matter of fact, I'm an adulterer on you. Okay, that's 15 for the night. That's what we're going to stop for tonight. Um, that's what we're going to stop for tonight. I want to thank you for um, tuning in with us for Bible study tonight. I hope that we said something that um, you learned, that you will examine yourself, challenge yourself to make a decision, to change some of your thinking, to go back and read, continue to read John chapter 17, continue to pray, continue to fast, um, to continue to seek the things of God. Again, thank you for tuning in with us tonight. Um, our next session will be on... Our next session will be uh, June 27, 7 o'clock, same station, same time. Again, we're going to close out with prayer. Father, I thank you tonight for this opportunity. I thank you tonight for this privilege. I pray for all of my brothers and sisters that are in, in the body of Christ. God, I don't pray for the world, but I pray for the body of Christ, my brothers and sisters that are in, in the body. I also pray, God, that you would not keep the enemy from them, but keep them from the evil one. Father God, I pray that their life would be a manifestation of not only you, but your Son and the Spirit operating in their life, Father. I pray, God, that there would be an open demonstration of the love of God in their life, that all men would know that they're your disciples. I pray, God, that as we learn tonight, God, that we will make a sacrifice, God, that we will lay down our life, our own personal agenda, that we would mentor and disciple the sheep and love the sheep and take care of those that you've entrusted to us because they're not ours, they're yours, God. I also pray tonight, God, that we will not lose one, God, and that if there's anyone that we've offended or that we've hurt, Father, that we pray now that we, we would be, you would forgive us and that your spirit would, would speak boldly to us and ask us to have, lead us to go to them and repent to them, God, and find out why, what happened, what took place, God, that we might be one as you and your son are one, that we might be one with each other, our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Father, I pray tonight for safe travel and passage. For those that are here tonight, God, that they will make it home safe even with this weather going on. But, Father, according to your word, as Jesus did, I rebuke the weather tonight in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the storm would not cause any damage. There would be no lives lost tonight, Father. That when we get home, everything would be the same as we left it. Better, even better, God. Because we know we've been in your presence. We've heard from you, God. And you've manifested yourself in our spirit through your preaching and teaching of your word. Not our own thoughts, not our own ideas or our philosophies. We bless you tonight in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.